You're listening to Phenomenology Club Radio. Hello and welcome to Speed Reading, Phenomenology Club's bi-weekly reading series formerly known as Book Club. We recently changed our name to make clear that actually, we do not read books. We read a different text by a different philosopher every other week, and these readings are easy to speed through, as each is brief at only 25 pages or less, provided to members with a link to an online PDF. Part of why this is our decided format is because we want newcomers to feel comfortable joining us at any time. So if you're interested in learning more about our series and about our club or how you could become a member for only $1 a month, please visit our website at www.phenomenology.club, which I have also linked in this upload description, as well as a link to the PDF of this text for anyone who wishes to read along with us. Phenomenology Club members receive unlimited access to all of our materials, but in the interest of public outreach, we do make select materials public, such as this audio recording of myself, Buttress, Reading aloud the first 25 pages of David Hume's seminal text titled An Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding. I've also uploaded our accompanying group discussion. We also have many other select public materials posted to this channel, so please be sure to subscribe. Please note I am very given to excitement and so this recording does contain some spontaneous vocal annotations. For ambiance, I've also included some underlying music, which is original Phenomenology Club music composed by our club member Mark Reardon, and for which I've also included a link in the description to where you can go download. We hope you enjoy this reading and that perhaps we will see you soon at a Phenomenology Club meeting. Take care. Stay trippy. Okay, you can hear me? I sure can. I sure can. All right, so this is me reading out loud the text by David Hume titled An Enquiry An Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding. I believe this was published in 1748. I think that's the date I saw last night when I looked it up. Well, I'll confirm that later. Huh? Long ass time ago. What? Long ass time ago. Long ass time ago. Basically. Rest in peace, David. Alright, let's do this. Hopefully I'll wake up over the course of this reading as I sip on this coffee and meditate deeply on the concepts that David is about to illuminate for us. Section 1 of the different species of philosophy. Moral philosophy, or the science of human nature, ooh, wow, already loaded. Damn, okay, let me start that over. I wasn't ready, I wasn't ready for that, David. Moral philosophy, or the science of human nature, may be treated after two different manners, each of which has its particular merit and may contribute to the entertainment, instruction, and reformation of mankind. The one considers man chiefly as born for action and as influenced in his measures by taste and sentiment, pursuing one object and avoiding another according to the value which these objects seem to possess and according to the light in which they present themselves. As virtue of all objects, is allowed to be the most valuable, this species of philosophers paint her in the most amiable colors, borrowing all helps from poetry and eloquence, and treating their subject in an easy and obvious manner, and such as is best fitted to please the imagination and engage the affections. They select the most striking observations and instances from common life, place opposite characters in a proper contrast, sorry I lost my spirit, and alluring us into the paths of virtue by the views of glory and happiness, direct our steps in these paths by the soundest precepts and most illustrious examples. They make us feel the difference between vice and virtue. They excite and regulate our sentiments, and so they can but bend our hearts to the love of probity and true honor. They think that they have fully attained the end of all their labors. Item number two, 
The other species of philosophers considers man in the light of a reasonable rather than an active being and endeavors to form his understanding more than cultivate his manners. They regard human nature as a subject of speculation and with a narrow scrutiny examine it in order to find those principles which regulate our understanding, excite our sentiments, and make us approve or blame any particular object, action, or behavior. They think if a reproach to all literature, they think it a reproach to all literature that philosophy should not have fixed beyond controversy the foundation of morals, reasoning, and criticism, and should forever talk of truth and falsehood, vice and virtue, beauty and deformity, without being able to determine the source of these distinctions. While they attempt this arduous task, they are deterred by no difficulties, but proceeding from particular instances to general principles, they still push on their inquiries mm, to principles more general, and rest not satisfied till they arrive at those original principles, which by, in every science, all human curiosity must be bounded. Though their speculations seem abstract and even unintelligible to common readers, they aim at the approbation of the learned and the wise, and think themselves sufficiently compensated for the labor of their whole lives if they can discover some hidden truths which may contribute to the instruction of posterity. Number three. It is certain that the easy and obvious philosophy will always, with the generality of mankind, have the preference above the accurate and abstruse, and by many will be recommended, not only as more agreeable, but more useful than the other. It enters more into common life, molds the heart and affections, and by touching those principles which actuate men, reforms their conduct, and brings them nearer to that model of perfection which it describes. On the contrary, the abstruse philosophy being founded on a turn of mind which cannot enter into business and action, vanishes when the philosopher leaves the shade and comes into open day nor can its principles easily retain any influence over our conduct and behavior. The feelings of our heart, the agitation of our passions, the vehemence of our actions dissipate all its conclusions and reduce the profound philosopher to a mere plebeian. This also must be confessed that the most durable, as well as justice fame, has been acquired by the easy philosophy, and that abstract reasoners seem hitherto to have enjoyed only a momentary reputation from the caprice or ignorance of their own age, but have not been able to support their renown with more equitable posterity. It is easy for a profound philosopher to commit a mistake in his subtle reasonings, and one mistake is the necessary parent of another, while he pushes on his consequences and is not deterred from embracing any conclusion by its unusual appearance or its contradiction to popular opinion. But a philosopher who purposes only to represent the common sense of mankind in more beautiful and more engaging colors, if by accident he falls into error, goes no farther, but renewing his appeal to common sense and the natural sentiments of the mind, returns into the right path and secures himself from any dangerous illusions. The fame of Cicero flourishes at present, but that of Aristotle is utterly decayed. Interesting. La Briere passes the seas and still maintains his reputation, but the glory of Malabranch is confined to his own nation and to his own age, and Addison perhaps will be read with pleasure when Locke shall be entirely forgotten. That's funny, because I have no idea who Addison is, but <laughs> we know who Locke is. Cool. The mere philosopher is a character, which is commonly but little acceptable in the world, as being supposed to contribute nothing either to the advantage or pleasure of society, while he lives remote from communication with mankind, and is wrapped up in principles and notions equally remote from their comprehension. On the other hand, the mere ignorant is still more despised, nor is anything deemed a sure sign of an illiberal genius in an age and nation where the sciences flourish, than to be entirely destitute of all relish for these noble entertainments.
The most perfect character is supposed to lie between those extremes, retaining an equal ability and taste for books, company, and business, preserving in conversation that discernment and delicacy which arise from polite letters and in business, that probity and accuracy which are the natural result of a just philosophy. In order to diffuse and cultivate so accomplished a character, nothing can be more useful than compositions of the easy style and manner, which draw not too much from life, require no deep application or retreat to be comprehended, and send back the student among mankind full of noble sentiments and wise precepts applicable to every exigence of human life. By means of such compositions, virtue becomes amiable, science is agreeable, company instructive, and retirement entertaining. Man is a- Excuse me? Well, somebody moved. Keep it to yourself. Man is a reasonable being, and as such, receives from science his proper food and nourishment. But so narrow are the bounds of human understanding that little satisfaction can be hoped for in this particular, either from the extent of, extent of security or his acquisitions. Man is a sociable, no less than a reasonable being. But neither can he always enjoy company agreeable and amusing, or preserve the proper relish for them. Man is also an active being, and from that disposition, as well as from the various necessities of human life, must submit to business and occupation. But the mind requires some relaxation, and cannot always support its bent to care and industry. It seems, then, that nature has pointed out a mixed kind of life as most suitable to the human race, and secretly admonish them to allow none of these biases to draw too much, so as to incapacitate them for other occupations and ent entertainments. Indulge your passion for science, says she, but let your science be human, and such as may have a direct reference to action and society. Abstruse thought and profound researches I would prohibit and will severely punish by the pensive melancholy which they introduce, by the endless uncertainty in which they involve you, and by the cold reception which your pretended discovery shall meet with when communicated. Be a philosopher, but amidst all your philosophy, be still a man. Damn, that got heavy. Number five. Were the generality of mankind contented to prefer the easy philosophy to the abstract and profound, without throwing any blame or contempt on the latter, it might not be improper, perhaps, to comply with this general opinion and allow every man to enjoy, without opposition, his own taste and sentiment. But as the matter is often carried farther, even to the absolute rejecting of all profound reasonings, or what is commonly called metaphysics, we shall now proceed to consider what can reasonably be pleaded in their behalf. We may begin with observing that one considerable advantage which results from the accurate and abstract philosophy is its subserviency to the easy and humane, which without the former can never attain a sufficient degree of exactness in its sentiments, precepts, or reasonings. All polite letters are nothing but pictures of human life in various attitudes and situations, and inspire us with different sentiments of praise or blame, admiration or ridicule, according to the qualities of the object which they set before us. An artist must be better qualified to succeed in this undertaking, who, besides a delicate taste and a quick apprehension, possess an accurate knowledge of the internal fabric, the operations of the understanding, the workings of the passions, and the various species of sentiment which discriminate vice and virtue. How painful soever this inward search or enquiry may appear it becomes in some measure requisite to those who would describe with success the obvious and outward appearances of life and manners. The anatomist presents to the eye the most hideous and disagreeable objects, but his science is useful to the painter in delineating even a velvet, a Venus, or a Helen. While the latter employs all the richest colors of his art and gives his figures the most graceful and engaging airs, he must still carry his attention to the inward structure of the human body, the position of the muscles, the fabric of the bones, 
and the use and figure of every part or organ. Accuracy is, in every case, advantageous to beauty and just reasoning to delicate sentiment. In vain would we exalt the one by depreciating the other. Besides, we may observe in every art or profession, even those which most concern life or action, that a spirit of accuracy, however acquired, carries all of them nearer their perfection and renders them more subservient to the interests of society. And though a philosopher may live remote from business, the genius of philosophy, if carefully cultivated by several, must gradually diffuse itself throughout the whole society and bestow a similar correctness on every art and calling. The politician will acquire greater foresight and subtility in the subdividing and balancing of power. The lawyer more method and finer principles in his reasonings, and the general more regularity in his discipline and more caution in his plans and operations. The stability of modern governments above the ancient and the accuracy of modern philosophy have improved and probably will still improve by similar gradations. Number six. These are just numbered paragraphs, by the way. It's not like they're necessarily a list. I'm not sure about the format. Just letting you know. Anyway, were there no advantage to be reaped from these studies beyond the gratification of an innocent curiosity, yet ought not even this to be despised as being one accession to those few safe and harmless pleasures which are bestowed on the human race? The sweetest and most inoffensive path of life leads through the avenues of science and learning. And whoever can either remove any obstructions in this way or open up any new prospect ought so far to be esteemed a benefactor to mankind. And though these researches may appear painful and fatiguing, it is with some minds as with some bodies, which being endowed with vigorous and florid health, require severe exercise and reap a pleasure from that to the generality of mankind may seem burdensome and laborious. Obscurity indeed is painful to the mind as well as to the eye, but to bring light from obscurity by whatever labor must needs be delightful and rejoicing. But this obscurity in the profound and abstract philosophy is objected to, not only as painful and fatiguing, but as the in inevitable source of uncertainty and error. Here indeed lies the justest and most plausible object objection against a considerable part of metaphysics, that they are not properly a science, but arise either from the fruitless efforts of human vanity, which would penetrate into subjects utterly inaccessible to the understanding, or from the craft of popular superstitions, which, being unable to defend themselves on fair ground, raise these entangling brambles to cover and protect their weakness. Chased from the open country, these robbers fly into the forest and lie in wait to break in upon every unguarded avenue of the mind and overwhelm it with religious fears and prejudices. The stoutest antagonist, if he remit his watch a moment, is oppressed, and many, through cowardice and folly, open the gate to his enemies and willingly receive them with reverence and submission as their legal sovereigns. Number seven. But is this a sufficient reason why philosophers should desist from such researches and leave superstition still in possession of her retreat? Is it not proper to draw an opposite conclusion and perceive the necessity of carrying the war into the most secret recesses of the enemy? In vain do we hope that men from frequent disappointment will at last abandon such airy sciences and discover the proper province of human reason. For besides, that many persons find too sensible an interest in perpetually recalling such topics. Besides this, I say, the motive of blind despair can never reasonably have place in the sciences, since, however unsuccessful former attempts may have proved, there is still room to hope that the industry, good fortune, or improved sagacity of succeeding generations may reach discoveries unknown to former agents. ages. Each adventurous genius will still leap at the arduous prize and find himself stimulated rather than discouraged by the failures of his predecessors, while he hopes that the glory of achieving so hard an adventure is reserved for him alone. 
The only method of freeing learning at once from these abstruse questions is to inquire seriously into the nature of human understanding and show from an exact analysis of its powers and capacity that, is by, that it is by no means fitted for such remote and abstruse subjects. We must submit to this fatigue in order to live at ease ever after and must cultivate true metaphysics with some care in order to destroy the false and adulterate. Indolence, which to some persons affords a safeguard against this deceitful philosophy, is, with others, overbalanced by curiosity and despair, which at some moments prevails, may give place afterwards to sanguine hopes and expectations. Accurate and just reasoning is the only Catholic remedy, fitted for all persons and all dispositions, and is alone able to subvert that abstruse philosophy and metaphysical jargon, which, being mixed up with popular superstition, renders in it a manner impenetrable to careless reasoners, and gives it the air of science and wisdom. Besides this advantage of rejecting, after deliberate inquiry, the most uncertain and disagreeable part of learning, there are many positive advantages, which result from an accurate scrutiny into the powers and faculties of human nature. It is remarkable concerning the operations of the mind that, though most intimately present to us, yet whenever they become the object of reflection, they seem involved in obscurity. Nor can the eye readily find those lines and boundaries which discriminate and distinguish them. The objects are too fine to remain long in the same aspect or situation, and must be apprehended in an instant by a superior penetration derived from nature and improved by habit and reflection. Reflection, by the way, is spelled with an X, not a CT. Important. It becomes, therefore, no inconsiderable part of science barely to know the different operations of the mind, to separate them from each other, to class them under their proper heads, and to correct all that seeming disorder in which they lie involved when made the object of reflection and inquiry. This talk of ordering and distinguishing, which has no merit, when performed with regard to external bodies, the objects of our senses rises in its value, when directed towards the operations of the mind, in proportion to the difficulty and labor which we meet with in performing it. And if we can go no farther than this mental geography, or delineation of the distinct parts and powers of the mind, it is at least a satisfaction to go so far, and the more obvious the science may appear, and it is by no means obvious, the more contemptible still must the ignorance of it be esteemed in all pretenders to learning and philosophy. Nor can there remain any suspicion that this science is uncertain and chimerical, unless we should entertain such a skepticism as is entirely subversive of all speculation and even action. It cannot be doubted that the mind is endowed with several powers and faculties, that these powers are distinct from each other, that what is really distinct to the immediate perception may dis be distinguished by reflection, and consequently that there is a truth and falsehood in all propositions on this subject, and a truth and falsehood which lie not beyond the compass of human understanding. There are many obvious distinctions of this kind, such as those between the will and understanding, the imagination and passions, which fall within the comprehension of every human creature, and the finer and more philosophical distinctions are no less real and certain, though more difficult to be comprehended. Some instances, especially late ones, of success in these inquiries may give us a juster notion of the certainty and solidity of this branch of learning. And shall we esteem it worthy the labor of a philosopher to give us a true system of the planets and adjust the position and order of those remote bodies, while we affect to overlook those who, with so much success, delineate the parts of the mind in which we are so intimately concerned? But, what, but may we not, oh, number nine. But may we not hope that philosophy, if cultivated with care and encouraged by the attention of the public, may carry its researches still farther and discover, at least in some degree, the secret springs and principles by which the human mind is actuated in its operations? Astronomers had long contented themselves with proving from the phenomena the true motions, order, and magnitude of the heavenly bodies. 
till a philosopher at last arose who seems, from the happiest reasoning, to have also determined the laws and forces by which the revolutions of the planets are governed and directed. The like has been performed with regard to other parts of nature. And there is no reason to despair of equal success in our enquiries concerning the mental powers and economy if prosecuted with equal capacity and caution. It is probable that one operation and principle of the mind depends on another, which, again, may be resolved into one more general and universal. And how far these researches may possibly be carried, it will be difficult for us before or even after a careful trial exactly to determine. This is certain, that attempts of this kind are every day made even by those who philosophize the most negligently. And nothing can be more requisite than to enter upon the enterprise with thorough care and attention, that if it lie within the compass of human understanding, it may at last be happily achieved. If not, it may, however, be rejected with some confidence and security. This last conclusion surely is not desirable nor ought it to be embraced too rashly. For how much must we diminish from the beauty and value of this species of philosophy upon such a supposition? Moralists have hitherto been accustomed when they considered the vast multitude and diversity of those actions that excite our approbation or dislike to search for some common principle on which this variety of sentiments might depend. And though they have sometimes carried the matter too far, by their passion for some one general principle, it must, however, be confessed that they are excusable in expecting to find some general principles into which all the vices and virtues were justly to be resolved. The like has been the endeavor of critics, logicians, and even politicians, nor have their attempts been wholly unsuccessful, though perhaps longer time, greater accuracy, and more ardent application may bring these sciences still nearer their perfection. To throw up at once all pretensions of this kind may justly be deemed more rash, precipitate, and dogmatical than even the boldest and most affirmative philosophy that has ever attempted to impose its crude dictates and principles on mankind. Number 10. What though these reasonings concerning human nature seem abstract and of difficult comprehension, this affords no presumption of their falsehood. On the contrary, it seems impossible that what has hitherto escaped so many wise and profound philosophers can be very obvious and easy. And whatever pains these researches may cost us, we may think ourselves sufficiently rewarded, not only in point of profit, but of pleasure if, by any means, by it, sorry, if by that means we can make any addition to our stock of knowledge in subjects of such unspeakable importance. But as, after all, the abstractedness of these speculations is no recommendation, but rather a disadvantage to them, and as this difficulty may be perhaps be surmounted by care and art, and the avoiding of all unnecessary detail, we have, in the following inquiry, attempted to throw some light upon subjects from which uncertainty has hitherto deterred the wise and obscurity the ignorant. Happy if we can unite the boundaries of the different species of philosophy, by reconciling profound inquiry with clearness and truth with novelty. And still more happy, if reasoning in this easy manner, we can undermine the foundations of an abstruse philosophy, which seems to have hitherto served only as a shelter to superstition and a cover to absurdity and error! Exclamation point. Okay, that's the end of section one. This, on the species of philosophies, and now this is section two of the origin of ideas. For anyone reading along in our PDF, this is the second half of page 13. Okay. And the itemized paragraphs continue. So this is number 11. Everyone will readily allow that there is a considerable difference between the perceptions of the mind when a man feels the pain of excessive heat or the pleasure of moderate warmth and when he afterwards recalls to his memory this sensation or anticipates it by his imagination. These faculties may mimic or copy the perceptions of the senses, but they never can entirely reach the force and vivacity of the original sentiment. 
the utmost we say of them, even when they operate with greatest vigor, is that they represent their object in so lively a manner that we could almost say we feel it or see it. But, except the mind be disordered by disease or madness, they never can arrive at such a pitch of vivacity as to render these perceptions altogether indistinguishable. All the colors of poetry, however splendid, can never paint natural objects in such a manner as to make the description be taken for a real landscape. <laughs> landscape. I've never seen that word. It's like landscape, but landscape. That sounds like a Pokemon. <laughs> the landscape Pokemon. You throw it and it just like confuses the enemy by making like a new landscape. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, landscape, new word, <laughs> I love it. Okay, let me do that sentence over. No, I won't, because I'll laugh again. Let me just continue. The most lively thought is still inferior to the dullest sensation. We may observe a like distinction to run through all the other perceptions of the mind. A man in a fit of anger is actuated in a very different manner from one who only thinks of that emotion. If you tell me that any person is in love, I easily understand your meaning and form a just conception of his situation, but never can mistake that conception for the real disorders and agitations of the passion. When we reflect on our past sentiments and affections, our thought is a faithful mirror and copies its objects truly, but the colors which it employs are faint and dull in comparison of those in which our original perceptions were clothed. It requires no nice discernment or metaphysical head to mark the distinction between them. Number 12. Here, therefore, we may divide all the perceptions of the mind into two classes or species, which are distinguished by their different degrees of force and vivacity. The less forcible and lively are commonly denominated thoughts or ideas. The other species want a name in our language, and in most others, I suppose, because it was not requisite for any but philosophical purposes to rank them under a general term or appellation. Let us therefore use a little freedom and call them impressions, employing that word in a sense somewhat different from the usual. By the term impression, then, I mean all our more lively perceptions, when we hear or see or feel or love or hate or desire or will. And impressions are distinguished from ideas, which are the less lively perceptions of which we are conscious when we reflect on any of those sensations or movements above mentioned. Number 13. Nothing at first view may seem more unbounded than the thought of man, which not only escapes all human power and authority, but is not even restrained within the limits of nature and reality. To form monsters and join incongruous shapes and appearances costs the imagination no more trouble than to conceive the most natural and familiar objects. And while the body is confined to one planet, along which it creeps with pain and difficulty, the thought can in an instant transport us into the most distant regions of the universe, or even beyond the universe, into the unbounded chaos where nature is supposed to lie in total confusion. Oh, I love that, total confusion. What never was seen or heard of may yet be conceived nor is anything beyond the power of thought, except which implies an absolute contradiction. But though our thought seems to possess this unbounded liberty, we shall find, upon a nearer examination, that it is really confined within very narrow limits, and that all this creative power of the mind amounts to no more than the faculty of compounding, transposing, augmenting, or diminishing the materials afforded us by the senses and experience. When we think of a golden mountain, we, can join, we only join two consistent ideas, gold and mountain, with which we were form, formerly acquainted. A virtuous horse we can conceive because, from our own feeling, we can conceive virtue, and this we may unite to the figure and shape of a horse, which is an animal familiar to us. In short, all the materials of thinking are derived either from our outward or inward sentiment. The mixture and composition of these belongs alone to the mind and will. Or, to express myself in philosophical language, 
All our ideas or more feeble perceptions are copies of our impressions or more lively ones. Ooh, David. I see where you're going. 14. To prove this, the two following arguments will, I hope, be sufficient. First, when we analyze our thoughts or ideas, however compounded or sublime, we always find that they resolve themselves into such simple ideas as were copied from a precedent feeling or sentiment. Even those ideas, which at first view seem the most wide of this origin, are found, upon a nearer scrutiny, to be derived from it. The idea of God as meaning an infinitely intelligent, wise, and good being, being is capitalized there, by the way, interested in knowing why choice of translation I don't know the idea of God as meaning an infinitely intelligent wise and good being arises from reflecting on the operations of our own mind and augmenting without limit those qualities of goodness and wisdom we may prosecute this inquiry to what length we please where we shall always find that every idea which we examine is copied from a similar impression those who would assert that this position is not universally true, nor without exception, have only one, and that an easy method of refuting it by producing that idea, which, in their opinion, is not derived from this source. It will then be incumbent on us, if we would maintain our doctrine, to produce the impression or lively perception which corresponds to it. Item number 15. Secondly, if it happen from a defect of the organ that a man is not susceptible of any species of sensation, we always find that he is as little susceptible of the correspondent ideas. A blind man can form no notion of colors, a deaf man of sounds. Restore either of them that sense in which he is deficient. By opening this new inlet for his sensations, you also open an inlet for the ideas, and he finds no difficulty in conceiving these objects. The case is the same if the object proper for exciting any sensation has ever been applied to the organ. Oh great, are we about to get racist in here? A Laplander? What the fuck is a Laplander? A Laplander or a Negro, David, has no notion of the relish of wine. <laughs> okay. And though there are few or no instances of a like deficiency in the mind, where a person has never felt or is wholly incapable of a sentiment or passion that belongs to his species, yet we find the same observation to take place in a less degree. That was so unnecessary, David. <laughs> a man of mild manners can form no idea of inveterate revenge or cruelty, nor can a selfish heart easily conceive the heights of friendship and generosity. It is readily allowed that other beings may possess many senses of which we can have no conception because the ideas of them have never been introduced to us in the only manner by which an idea can have access to the mind, to wit, by the actual feeling and sensation. Number 16. There is, however, one contradictory phenomenon which may prove that it is not absolutely impossible for ideas to arise independent of their correspondent impressions. I believe it will readily be allowed that the several distinct ideas of color which enter by the eye or those of sound which are conveyed by the ear are really different from each other, though at the same time resembling. Now if this be true of different colors, it must be no less so of the different shades of the same color, and each shade produces a distinct idea, independent of the rest. For if this should be denied, it is possible, by the continual gradation of shades, to run a color insensibly into what is most remote from it. And if you will not allow any of the means to be different, you cannot, without absurdity, deny the extremes to be the same. Mm -hmm. 
Suppose, therefore, a person who have enjoyed his sight for 30 years and have become perfectly acquainted with colors of all kinds except one particular shade of blue, for instance, which it never has been his fortune to meet with. Let all the different shades of that color except that single one be placed before him, descending gradually from the deepest to the lightest. It is plain that he will perceive a blank where that shade is wanting and will be sensible that there is a greater distance in that place between the contiguous colors than in any other. Now I ask whether it be possible for him from his own imagination to supply this deficiency and raise up to himself the idea of that particular shade though it had never been conveyed to him by his senses? I believe there are few, but will be of opinion that he can, and this may serve as a proof that the simple ideas are not always, in every instance, derived from the correspondent impressions, though this instance is so singular that it is scarcely worth our observing, and does not merit that for it alone we should alter our general maxim. Wow, that's interesting. Cool thought, David. Thanks. Number 17. Here, therefore, is a proposition, which not only seems in itself simple and intelligible, but, if a proper use were made of it, might render every dispute equally intelligible and banish all that jargon which is so long taken possession of metaphysical reasonings and drawn disgrace upon them. All ideas, especially abstract ones, are naturally faint and obscure. The mind has but a slender hold of them. They are apt to be confounded with other resembling ideas, and when we have often employed any term, though without a distinct meaning, we are apt to imagine it has a determinate idea annexed to it. On the contrary, all impressions, that is, all sensations, either outward or inward, are strong and vivid. The limits between them are more exactly determined nor is it easy to fall into any error or mistake with regard to them. When we entertain, therefore, any suspicion that a philosophical term is employed without any meaning or idea, as is but too frequent, we need but inquire from what impression is that supposed idea derived. And if it be impossible to assign any, this will serve to confirm our suspicion. By bringing ideas into so clear a light, we may reasonably hope to remove all dispute which may arise concerning their nature and reality. But admitting these terms, impressions, and ideas, in the sense above explained, and understanding by innate what is original or copied from no precedent perception, then may we assert that all our impressions are innate, and our ideas not innate. To be ingenuous, I must own it to be my opinion that Locke was betrayed into this question by the schoolmen who, making use of undefined terms, draw out their disputes to a tedious length without ever touching the point in question. A like ambiguity and circumlocution seem to run through that philosopher's reasonings on this as well as most other subjects. Okay, interesting. So that's the end of section two page 17. Thank you, David. Okay. Section 3, middle of page 17. And this starts paragraph 18. It's called On the Association of of the Association of Ideas. Oof. It is evident that there is a principle of connection between the different thoughts or ideas of the mind and that in their appearance to the memory or imagination, they introduce each other with a certain degree of method and regularity. In our more serious thinking or discourse, this is so observable that any particular thought which breaks in upon the regular tract or chain of ideas is immediately remarked and rejected. And even in our wildest and most wandering reveries, nay, in our very dreams, we shall find, if we reflect, that the imagination ran not altogether at adventures, but that there was still a connection, that's with an X, not a CT, a 
connection upheld among the different ideas which succeeded each other. Were the loosest and freest conversation to be transcribed, there would immediately be observed something which connected in it in all its transitions. Or where this is wanting, the person who broke the thread of discourse might still inform you that there had secretly revolved in his mind a succession of thought, which had gradually led him from the subject of conversation. Among different languages, even where we cannot suspect the least connection or communication, it is found that the words expressive of ideas, the most compounded, do yet nearly correspond to each other. A certain proof that the simple ideas comprehended in the compound ones were bound together by some universal principle, which had an equal influence on all mankind. Oh, I love that. Number 19. Though it is, though it be, what, David? Though it be too obvious to escape observation that different ideas are connected together, I do not find that any philosopher has attempted to enumerate or class all the principles of association, a subject, however, that seems worthy of curiosity. To me, there appear to be only three principles of connection among ideas, namely, resemblance, contiguity in time or place and cause or effect. That these principles serve to connect ideas will not, I believe, be much doubted. A picture naturally leads our thoughts to the original. The mention of one apartment in a building naturally introduces an inquiry or discourse concerning the others, and if we think of a wound, we can scarcely forbear reflecting on the pain which follows it. But that this enumeration is complete and that there are no other principles of association except these may be difficult to prove to the satisfaction of the reader or even to a man's own satisfaction. All we can do in such cases is to run over several instances and examine carefully the principle which binds the different thoughts to each other, never stopping till we render the principle as general as possible. The more instances we examine and the more care we employ, the more assurance shall we acquire that the enumeration which we form from the whole is complete and entire. Okay, cool, David. Thank you. That was section three. Now we're on to section four. That was a very short section. Section four, skeptical doubts concerning the operations of the understanding. Um, page 18 bottom of page 18 paragraph number 20 and there's two part or more than one part so this is part one of section four all the objects of human reason or inquiry may naturally be divided into two kinds to wit relations of ideas and matters of fact of the first kind are the sciences of geometry algebra and arithmetic and in short every affirmation which is either intuitively or demonstratively certain that the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the square of the two sides is a proposition which expresses a relation between these figures that three times five is equal to the half of thirty expresses a relation between these numbers propositions of this kind are discoverable by the mere operation of thought without dependence on what is anywhere existent in the universe Though there never were a circle or triangle in nature, the truths demonstrated by Euclid would forever retain their certainty and evidence. 21. Matters of fact, which are the second objects of human reason, are not ascertained in the same manner, nor is our evidence of their truth, however great, of a like nature with the foregoing. The contrary of every matter of fact is still possible because it can never imply a contradiction and is conceived by the mind with the same facility and distinctness as if ever so conformable to reality. That the sun will not rise tomorrow is no less intelligible a proposition and implies no more contradiction than the affirmation that it will rise. We should in vain, therefore, attempt to demonstrate its falsehood. Were it demonstratively false, it would imply a contradiction and could never be distinctly conceived by the mind. 
It may therefore be a subject worthy of curiosity to inquire what is the nature of that evidence which assures us of any real existence and matter of fact beyond the present testimony of our senses or the records of our memory. This part of philosophy, it is observable, has been little cultivated, either by the ancients or moderns, and therefore our doubts and errors in the prosecution of so important an inquiry may be the more excusable. While we march through our difficult, while we march through, hold on. While we march through such difficult paths without any guide or direction, they may even prove useful by exciting curiosity and destroying that implicit faith and security which is the bane of all reasoning and free inquiry. The discovery of defects in the common philosophy, if any such there be, will not, I presume, be a discouragement, but rather an incitement, as is usual, to attempt something more full and satisfactory than has yet been proposed to the public. 22. <clears throat> all reasonings concerning matter of fact seem to be founded on the relation of cause and effect. By means of that relation alone, we can go beyond the evidence of our memory and senses. If you were to ask a man why he believes any matter of fact, which is absent, for instance, that his friend is in the country or in France, he would give you a reason. And this reason would be some other fact, as a letter received from him or the knowledge of his former resolutions and promises. A man that there had once been a man finding a watch or any other machine in a desert island would conclude that there had once been men in that island. All our reasonings concerning fact are of the same nature, and here it is constantly supposed that there is a connection between the present fact and that which is inferred from it. Were there nothing to bind them together, the inference would be entirely precarious. The hearing of an articulate voice and rational discourse in the dark assures us of the presence of some person. Why? Because, there are the, because these are the effects of the human make and fabric, and closely connected with it. If we anatomize all the other reasonings of this nature, we shall find that they are founded on the relation of cause and effect, and that this relation is either near or remote, direct or collateral. Heat and light are collateral effects of fire, and the one effect may justly be inferred from the other. 23. If we would satisfy ourselves, therefore, concerning the nature of that evidence which assures us of matters of fact, we must inquire how we arrive at the knowledge of cause and effect. I shall venture to affirm, as a general proposition, which admits of no exception, that the knowledge of this relation is not, in any instance, attained by reasonings a priori, but arises entirely from experience. When we find that any particular objects are constantly conjoined with each other, let an object be presented to a man of ever so strong natural reason and abilities. If that object be entirely new to him, he will not be able, by the most accurate examination of its sensible qualities, to discover any of its cause or effects. Adam, through his rational faculties, be supposed, though his rational faculties be supposed, at the very first entirely perfect, could not have inferred from the fluidity and transparency of water that it would suffocate him, or from the light and warmth of fire that it would consume him. No object ever discovers, by the qualities which appear to the senses, either the causes which produced it or the effects which will arise from it, nor can our reason, unassisted by experience, ever draw any inference concerning real existence and matter of fact. 24. This proposition, that causes and effects are discoverable, not by reason but by experience, will readily be admitted with regard to such, such objects as we remember to have once been altogether unknown to us, since we must be conscious of the utter inability which we then lay under of foretelling what would arise from them. Present two smooth pieces of marble to a man who has no tincture of natural philosophy, he will never discover that they will adhere together in such a manner as to require great force to separate them in a direct line, while they make so small a resistance to a lateral pressure. 
such events as bear little analogy to the common course of nature are also readily confessed to be known only by experience. Nor does any man imagine that the explosion of gunpowder or the attraction of a lodestone could ever be discovered by arguments a priori. In like manner, when an effect is supposed to depend upon an intricate machinery or secret structure of parts, we make no difficulty in attributing all our knowledge of it to experience. Who will assert that he can give the ultimate reason why milk or bread is proper nourishment for a man, not for a lion or a tiger? But the same truth may not appear at first sight to have the same evidence with regard to events, which have become familiar to us from our first appearance in the world, which bear a close analogy to the whole course of nature, and which are supposed to depend on the simple qualities of objects without any secret structure of parts. We are apt to imagine that we could discover these effects by the mere operation of our reason without experience. We fancy that were we brought on a sudden into this world, we could at first have inferred that one billiard ball would communicate motion to another upon impulse, and that we needed not to have waited for the event in order to pronounce with certainty concerning it. Such is the influence of custom that, where it is strongest, it not only covers our natural ignorance, but even conceals itself and seems not to take place merely because it is found in the highest degree. 25. But to convince us all that laws of nature and all the operations of bodies without exception are known only by experience, the following reflections may perhaps suffice. Were any object presented to us, and were we required to pronounce concerning the effect which will result from it, without consulting past observation, after what manner, I beseech you, must the mind proceed in this operation? It must invent or imagine some event, which it ascribes to the object as its effect, and it is plain that this invention must be entirely arbitrary. The mind can never possibly find the effect in the supposed cause by the most accurate scrutiny and examination, for the effect is totally different from the cause and consequently can never be discovered in it. Motion in the second billiard ball is a quite distinct event from motion in the first, nor is there anything in the one to suggest the smallest hint of the other. A stone or piece of metal raised into the air and left without any support immediately falls. But to consider the matter a priori, is there anything we discover in this situation which can beget the idea of a downward rather than an upward or any other motion in the stone or metal? And as the first imagination or invention of a particular effect in all natural operation is arbitrary, where we consult not experience, so must we also esteem the supposed tie or connection between the cause and effect which binds them together, and renders it impossible that any other effect could result from the operation of that cause. When I see, for instance, a billiard ball moving in a straight line towards another, even suppose motion in the second ball should be an accident be suggested to me as the result of their contact or impulse, may I not conceive that a hundred different events might as well follow from that cause? May not both these balls remain at absolute rest? May not the first ball return in a straight line or leap off from the second in any line or direction? All these suppositions are consistent and conceivable. Why then should we give preference to one, which is no more consistent or conceivable than the rest? All our reasonings a priori will never be able to show us any foundation for this preference. In a word then, every effect is a distinct event from its cause. It could not therefore be discovered in the cause, and the first invention or conception of it a priori must be entirely arbitrary. And even after it is suggested, the conjunction of it with the cause must appear equally arbitrary, since there are always many other effects, which to reason must seem fully as consistent and natural. In vain, therefore, should we pretend to determine any single event or infer any cause or effect without the assistance of observation and experience. Hence we may discuss 26, sorry. Hence we may discover the reason why no philosopher who is rational and modest has ever pretended to assign the ultimate cause of any natural operation or to show distinctly the action of that power which produces any single effect in the universe. 
It is confessed that the utmost effort of human reason is to reduce the principles, productive of natural phenomena, to a greater simplicity and to resolve the many particular effects into a few general causes by means of reasonings from analogy, experience, and observation. But as to the causes of these general causes, we should in vain attempt their discovery, nor shall we ever be able to satisfy ourselves by any particular explication of them. These ultimate springs and principles are totally shut up from human curiosity and inquiry. Elasticity, gravity, cohesion of parts, communication of motion by impulse, these are probably the ultimate causes and principles which we shall ever discover in nature, and we may esteem ourselves sufficiently happy if, by accurate inquiry and reasoning, we can trace up the particular phenomena to or near to these general principles. The most perfect philosophy of the natural kind only staves off our ignorance a little longer, as perhaps the most perfect philosophy of the moral or metaphysical kind serves only to discover larger portions of it. Thus the observation of human blindness and weakness is the result of all philosophy, and meets us at every turn, in spite of our endeavors to elude or avoid it. Wow, preach! Love it. Okay, page 23, paragraph 27. Nor is geometry, when taken into the assistance of natural philosophy, ever able to remedy this defect or lead us into the knowledge of ultimate causes by all that accuracy of reasoning for which it is so justly celebrated. Every part of mixed mathematics proceeds upon the supposition that certain laws are established by nature in her operations, and abstract reasonings are employed either to assist experience in the discovery of these laws, or to determine their influence in particular instances, where it depends upon any precise degree of distance and quantity. Thus, it is a law of motion discovered by experience that the moment or force of any body in motion is in the compound ratio or proportion of its solid contents and its velocity, and consequently, that a small force may remove the greatest obstacle or raise the greatest weight, if, by any contrivance or machinery, we can increase the velocity of that force so as to make it an overmatch for its antagonist. Geometry assists us in the application of this law by giving us the just dimensions of all the parts and figures which can enter into any species of machine, but still the discovery of the law itself is owing merely to experience, and all the abstract reasonings in the world can never lead us one step towards the knowledge of it. When we reason a priori and consider merely any object or cause as it appears to the mind, independent of all observation, it never could suggest to us the notion of any distinct object, such as its effect, much less show us the inseparable and inviolable connection between them. A man must be very sagacious who would discover by reasoning that crystal is the effect of heat and ice of cold without being previously acquainted with the operations of these qualities. Part 2. This is part 2 of section 4, paragraph 28. But we have not yet attained any tolerable satisfaction with regard to the question first proposed. Each solution still gives rise to a new question as difficult as the foregoing, and leads us on to farther inquiries. When it is asked, what is the nature of all our reasonings concerning matter of fact? The proper answer seems to be that they are founded on the relation of cause and effect. When again it is asked, what is the foundation of all our reasonings and conclusions concerning that relation, it may, re it may be replied in one word, experience, capital E. But if we still carry on our sifting humor and ask, what is the foundation of all conclusions from experience, this implies a new question, which may be of more difficult solution and explication. Philosophers that give themselves airs of superior wisdom and sufficiency have a hard task when they encounter persons of inquisitive dispositions who push them from every corner to which they retreat and who are sure at last to bring them to some dangerous dilemma. The best expedient to prevent this confusion is to be modest in our pretensions and even to discover the difficulty ourselves before it is objected to us. 
By this means, we may make a kind of merit of our very ignorance. Okay, so ignorance is virtue. Right? Love it. I shall content myself in this section with an easy task and shall pretend only to give a negative answer to the question here proposed. I say then that even after we have experience of the operations of cause and effect, our conclusions from that experience are not founded on reasoning or any process of the understanding. This answer we must endeavor both to explain and to defend. Paragraph 29. It must certainly be allowed that nature has kept us at a great distance from all her secrets and has afforded us only the knowledge of a few superficial qualities of objects while she conceals from us those powers and principles on which the influence of those objects entirely depends. Our senses inform us of the color, weight, and consistence of bread, but neither sense nor reason can ever inform us of those qualities which fit it for the nourishment and support of a human body. Sight or feeling conveys an idea of the actual motion of bodies, but as to that wonderful force or power which would carry on a moving body forever and a continued change of place and which bodies never lose but by communicating it to others, of this we cannot form the most distant conception. But notwithstanding this ignorance of natural powers and principles, we always presume, when we see like sensible qualities, that they have like secret powers, and expect that effects, similar to those which we have experienced, will follow from them. If a body of like color and consistence with that bread, which we have formerly eaten, be presented to us, we make no scruple of repeating the experiment and foresee with certainty like nourishment and support. Now this is a process of the mind or thought of which I would willingly know the foundation. It is allowed on all hands that there is no known connection between the sensible qualities and the secret powers. <laughs> And consequently, that the mind is not led to form such a conclusion concerning their constant and regular conjunction by anything which it knows of their nature. As to past experience, capital E again, wondering why they did that. As to past experience, it can be allowed to give direct and certain information of those precise objects only, and that precise period of time which fell under its cognizance. But why this experience should be extended to future times and to other objects, which for aught we know, may be only in appearance similar. This is the main question on which I would insist. The bread which I formerly eat nourished me. That is, a body of such sensible qualities was, at the time, endued with such secret powers. But does it follow that other bread must also nourish me at another time, and that like sensible qualities must always be attended with like secret powers? The consequence seems no wise necessary. At least, it must be acknowledged that there is here a consequence drawn by the mind, that there is a certain step taken, a process of thought, and an inference which wants to be explained. These two propositions are far from being the same. I have found that such an object has always been attended with such an effect, and I foresee that other objects which are in appearance similar will be attended with similar effects. I shall allow, if you please, that the one proposition may justly be inferred from the other. I know, in fact, that it always is inferred. But if you insist that the inference is made by a chain of reasoning, I desire you to produce that reasoning. The connection between these propositions is not intuitive. There is required a medium which may enable the mind to draw such an inference if indeed it be drawn by reasoning and argument. What that medium is, I must confess, passes my comprehension, and it is incumbent on those to produce it, who assert that it really exists, and is the origin of all our conclusions concerning matter of fact. Wow. That's deep. Okay, 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 David. I got it, I think. Okay, paragraph 30. 
This negative argument must certainly, in process of time, become altogether convincing. If many penetrating and able philosophers shall turn their inquiries this way, and no one be ever able to discover any connecting proposition or intermediate step which supports the understanding in this conclusion. But as the question is yet new, every reader may not tr may not trust so far to his own penetration as to conclude because an argument escapes his inquiry that therefore it does not really exist for this reason it may be requisite to venture upon a more difficult task and enumerating all the branches of human knowledge endeavor to show that none of them can afford such an argument all reasonings may be divided into two kinds namely demonstrative reasoning or that concerning relations of ideas and moral reasoning, or that concerning matter of fact and existence. That there are no demonstrative arguments in the case seems evident, since it implies no contradiction that the course of nature may change, and that an object seemingly like those which we have experienced may be attended with different or contrary effects. May I not clearly and distinctly conceive that a body falling from the clouds, and which in all other respects resembles snow, has yet the taste of salt or feeling of fire? Is there any more intelligible proposi proposition than to affirm that all the trees will flourish in December and January, and decay in May and June? Now, whatever is intelligible and can be distinctly conceived implies no contradiction and can never be proved false by any demonstrative argument or abstract reasoning a priori. If we be, therefore, engaged by arguments to put trust in past experience and make it the standard of our future judgment, these arguments must be probable only, or such as regard matter of fact and real existence according to the division above mentioned. But that there is no argument of this kind must appear if our explication of that species of reasoning be admitted as solid and satisfactory. We have said that all arguments concerning existence are founded on the relation of cause and effect, that our knowledge of that relation is derived entirely from experience, and that all our experimental conclusions proceed upon the supposition that the future will be conformable to the past. To endeavor, therefore, the proof of this last supposition by probable arguments, or arguments regarding existence, must be evidently going in a circle, and taking that for granted, which is the very point in question. 31. In reality, all arguments from experience are founded on the similarity which we discover among natural objects, and by which we are induced to expect effects similar to those which we have found to follow from such objects. And though none but a fool or madman will ever pretend to dispute the authority of experience or to reject that great guide of human life, it may surely be allowed a philosopher to have so much curiosity, at least, as to examine the principle of human nature, which gives this mighty authority to experience and makes us draw advantage from that similarity which nature has placed among different objects. From causes which appear similar, we expect similar effects. This is the sum of all our experimental conclusions. Now, it seems evident that, if this conclusion were formed by reason, it would be as perfect at first, and upon one instance, as, ever, as after ever so long a course of experience. But the case is far otherwise. Nothing so like as eggs, yet no one, on account of this appearing similarity, expects the same taste and relish in all of them. It is only after a long course of uniform experiments in any kind that we attain a firm reliance and security with regards to par a particular event. Now where is that process of reasoning which, from one instance, draws a conclusion so different from that which it infers from a hundred instances that are no wise different from that single one? This question I propose as much for the sake of information as with an intention of raising difficulties. I cannot find, I cannot imagine any such reasoning. But I keep my mind still open to instruction, if anyone will vouchsafe to bestow it on me. 32. Should it be said that, from a number of uniform experiments, we infer a connection between the sensible qualities and the secret powers, this, I must confess, seems the same difficulty, couched in different terms. The question still recurs. On what process of argument this inference is founded? Where is the medium, the interposing ideas, which join propositions so very wide of each other? It is confessed that the color, consistence, and other sensible qualities of bread appear not 
of themselves to have any connection with the secret powers of nourishment and support. For otherwise, we can infer these secret powers from the first appearance of these sensible qualities without the aid of experience. Contrary to the sentiment of all philosophers and contrary to plain matter of fact, here then is our natural state of ignorance with regard to the powers and influence of all objects. How is this remedied by experience? It only shows us a number of uniform effects resulting from certain objects and teaches us that those particular objects at that particular time were endowed with such powers and forces. When a new object endowed with similar sensible qualities is produced, we expect similar powers and forces and look for a like effect. From a from a body of like color and consistence with bread, we expect like nourishment and support. Where'd I go? But this surely is a step or progress of the mind which wants to be explained. When a man says, I have found in all past instances such sensible qualities conjoined with such secret powers, and when he says similar sensible qualities will always be conjoined with similar secret powers, he is not guilty of a tautology, nor are these propositions in any respect the same. You say that the one proposition is not intuitive, neither is it demonstrative. Of what nature is it then? To say it is experimental is begging the question, for all inference for inferences from experience suppose as their foundation that the future will resemble the past and that similar powers will be conjoined with similar sensible qualities. If there be any suspicion that the course of nature may change and that the past may be no rule for the future, all experience becomes useless and can give rise to no inference or conclusion. It is impossible, therefore, that any arguments from experience can prove this resemblance of the past to the future, since all the arguments are founded on the supposition of that resemblance. Let the course of things be allowed hitherto ever so regular, that alone, without some new argument or inference, proves not that, for the future, it will continue so. In vain do you pretend to have learned the nature of bodies from your past experience. Their secret nature, and consequently all their effects and influence may change without any change in their sensible qualities. This happens sometimes, and with regard to some objects. Why may it not happen always, and with regard to all objects? What logic, what process of argument secures you against this supposition? My practice, you say, refutes my doubts, but you mistake the purport of my question. As an agent, I am quite satisfied in the point, but as a philosopher who has some share of curiosity, I will not say skepticism, I want to learn the foundation of this inference. No reading, no inquiry has yet been able to remove my difficulty or give me satisfaction in a matter of such importance. Can I do better than propose the difficulty to the public, even though perhaps I have small hopes of obtaining a solution we shall at last at least by this means be sensible of our ignorance if we do not augment our knowledge 33 I must confess that a man is guilty of unpardonable arrogance who concludes because an argument has escaped his own investigation that therefore it does not really exist I must also confess that though all the learned for several ages should have employed themselves in fruitless search upon any subject it may still perhaps be rash to conclude positively that the subject must therefore pass all human comprehension even though we examine all the sources of our knowledge and conclude them unfit for such a subject, there may still remain a suspicion that the enumeration is not complete or the examination not accurate. But with regard to the present subject, there are some considerations which seem to remove all this accusation of arrogance or suspicion is made. It is certain that the most ignorant and stupid peasants, nay, infants, nay, even brute beasts, improve by experience and learn the qualities of natural objects by observing the effects which result from them. When a child has felt the sensation of pain from touching the flame of a candle, he will be careful not to put his hand near any candle, but will expect a similar effect from a cause which is similar in its sensible qualities and appearance. 
If you assert, therefore, that the understanding of the child is led into this conclusion by any process of argument or ratiocination, I may justly require you to produce that argument, nor have you any pretense to refuse so equitable a demand. You cannot say that the argument is abstruse and may possibly escape your inquiry, since you confess that it is obvious to the capacity of a mere infant. If you hesitate, therefore, a moment, or if, after reflection, you produce any intricate or profound argument, you, in a manner, give up the question and confess that it is not reasoning which engages us to suppose the past resembling the future and to expect similar effects from causes which are, to appearance, similar. This is the proposition which I intended to enforce in the present section. If I be right, I pretend not to have made any mighty discovery, and if I be wrong, I must acknowledge myself to be indeed a very backward scholar, since I cannot now discover an argument which, it seems, was perfectly familiar to me long before I was out of my cradle. BOOM! Alright, I have to run to the store. That was so great, David, thank you!